Well, I'm supposed to be discussing the growth and the challenges of population, urban and rural. And um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, Henry called, and I can never say no to Henry, so here I am. And I just wanted to, to make sure that that um, everyone understands that how you are raised, I believe, makes a difference in how you view problems and solutions and cooperation and all the things, especially that I heard Jim and Rich talk about, which is which are relationships. So I'm going to give you a little brief history of why I am the kind of person I am. And then I'll go into, hi, Catherine. She's... Well, nothing. <laughs> I look across the room and I see so many people, and I know so many people, and I know what good work you do. And many of the stories that I'm going to tell are going to involve some of you. So first, of, well, that isn't first of all. That isn't second of all. Um, my family came here um, from Sweden in 1902 and from Croatia in 1912. Uh, my family was in the fishing industry for hundreds of years before they came. And when they entered Bellingham Bay, there was a picture in my grandparents' house and it looked like you were coming right in, uh, um, I mean, it looked like you were coming right into Bellingham Bay and there was a picture of where they lived on the island of Vis. So I grew up in a fishing family. So my big experience originally with water, which is the source of some of the, the uh, information here was salt water. Uh, salt water that supported the fish. Um, I didn't know a lot about whether it was clean or whether it was meeting in-stream flows or whether we had culverts. I didn't know much of that. But I knew that we were a working class fishing family and that's how we survived. Um, I also came from a family that was apolitical, which I didn't realize at the time was sometimes unique. So I later found out my father was a Republican, my mom was a Democrat, but we never talked about it at home. So I had the advantage of being able to talk about issues without assigning a political position to them or a political solution to them. And my mother also didn't like people to argue. And I soon figured out that being direct and arguing were two different things. She never did figure that out. That was always making her uncomfortable. If you looked at the picture that was just up there, that's me when I was three years old. So when my family built their first house in 1950, there was no growth. There was no growth in Bellingham. That's right across from Fairhaven Middle School. There were no houses from where I lived on Hawthorne Road, second house on the street down to Cowgill, which had some of the older homes on it, but it was just all grass fields. Wild fruit trees, deer, other animals, and um, I just thought that was the way it is. As I was growing up, I figured out that I enjoyed solving problems, and I enjoyed working with people, and I enjoyed representing my community. So when you see the picture of Kelly on the Santa Claus's lap, that just means that I had a commitment to representing my community even when I was in high school. So I represented the city, our city, as the Miss Blossom Time Queen. Are you, <laughs> Henry's helping me, um, which I did for a year. And I got the pleasure of, of talking about Bellingham, being around Bellingham and being around the state and, and representing our community. I got married, I had two children, and I ended up um, going to the legislature. So when you see the picture of the little kid sitting on my lap, that's my 19-year-old college sophomore granddaughter, because uh, I was in the legislature for 17 years. And it was the most wonderful experience to represent Whatcom County, because I represented Bellingham, and I represented the county. So the stories you tell about the the values and the attitudes of the ag community or the forestry community um, or the fishing community are all things I heard firsthand. And I appreciate the way our community deals with the growth and the environmental challenges that we have. So I feel like I have a background to talk about that. Um, I came home and became mayor of Bellingham. Smaller stage, smaller um, group of people to work with in some ways. 
But I still believe in being a, a problem solver. And I still believe that relationships, experience, trust, respect, um, are all and common goals are all what we need to do if we're gonna if we're gonna solve this um, issue of managing our natural resources on an on a watershed basis, so with our community, and not pitting growth and the environment against each other. Because when I was growing up here, there were 35,000 people. That's 50,000 people increase in the last, what, however old I am, years. And it, there was some, for a while you didn't notice, but now you notice, now you notice. Um, we did a, a survey in the city of Bellingham, and it was, what are your three top issues? Homelessness, and many of you I know, know that we're really experiencing that. Affordable housing for everybody else, and jobs. So those are the things that keep me busy all the time, and I know that I can't be successful in my, in my position unless everybody else is successful too. And so I'm very, I'm very um, open, uh, uh, as always, to the, to the fact that what Jim was talking about, the framework. In 1998, we, we tried to put together a framework. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions at the end. I'll let you raise your hand to see why maybe it didn't work as well as we wished it had. 1998, that's what, 20, 20 years ago? <laughs> yeah, a while. Um, it had out outcomes. It had protect water quality. It had look at both water quantity as it affects in-stream purposes and out-of-stream purposes. It said look at habitat and make sure that the habitat we have is healthy for fish and for people. So we had some outcomes identified. We had a framework set up. Um, we sat people down in a room, and I say we, but our community, and we didn't necessarily come up with all the solutions that we thought we would if we could agree on those outcomes and the solutions that would benefit everybody and not each of us separately. Um, and so the questions I have are, you know, basically, why, why didn't it happen? Was there not a real uh, agreement on what the outcomes were? Did we all respect or not respect that each other's outcomes would mean that we would have to have compromises in our solutions that still preserved and supported our principles? Did we have the trust, the respect, the relationships in place so that we could be honest with each other in a room and talk about what we really needed, listen to what the other person really needed, and then say, okay, what are our options to solve this problem? And I think that this community is very well poised to do that. Um, and I have to admit, I've been to several meetings like this and I'm always very energized and very optimistic that we are going to find a solution to this. So two of the things that, that I believe are, if you can find groups of people that are willing to work together, but maintain the principles that could become then, solutions could become part of a bigger plan, I would encourage everyone to do that. Because action is important. I think that we probably, um, talk this issue to death in some ways. But I think we need to bring that, that respect and those relationships um, and those common goals together because I do think we can solve problems. And I think we have examples across our community where we have done that. And I think there are common goals. I think there is mutual respect. And I've been one that always believed that you don't decide to trust someone you, you could decide that, but that feeling you have in your heart that says, I know I can be myself in front of this person and they're not going to judge me, but they're going to listen to me and I'm going to listen to them, that comes with working together. When you work with somebody and you both are being very honest and direct and then you follow up in the solution with what you said you do, that's what builds trust in a community. And I believe this community is the kind of community where there is a lot of trust, 
where there are people willing to take a chance, and where we can look at incremental steps in some ways that fit into the whole framework that we put together as, as a group. So I spent a lot of time with Jim, and everything he just said about me earlier was not really true. I've been out of the water business for quite a while. But I do, I do know a lot about it, and I do understand that every um, community, every government entity, every private business, um, every environmental group, we all have a responsibility to work together to make sure that we don't, that we actually see solutions that work on the ground. Um, our environment can't wait, our people can't wait, our economy can't wait. Um, they're all tied together. So um, why should you care? So I'm going to leave time for you to come to the microphone and tell me why you should care. <laughs> because it's important that we all have a reason in our mind that says, I'm willing to step out of my comfort zone. I'm willing to put aside my own personal solutions to a problem and listen to a larger solution that would include more, more of us. Um, but never give up your principles. That's the thing. Solutions and principles are two different things. Principles are the outcomes you want to see in the end and the things that you're not going to give up on. You're not going to give up on clean water. You're not going to give up on increased fisheries. You're not going to give up on riparian areas. You're not going to give up on money so or water so people can actually live and work in our community. You're not going to give up on the livelihood that people need so that they have the means, the resources, and our support the programs that are going to make our community better. None of us none of us can give up on those principles, but we can look for new solutions. And everybody that spoke today, I think, had examples of solutions that they could bring forward that had worked for them. So with that, I'm going to stop because I think we've had enough speakers. <laughs> and I'm going to apologize for having all these pictures of me, but I wanted you to really understand that I have committed myself to public service my whole life. I have committed myself to putting my feelings and the way I think it should be outside, but I've never given up on my principles. And that's what can hold us all together. So this me when I was three, pretty cute little kid, don't you think? And my sister and my brother-in-law just bought my parents' house. They both passed away in the last year. And that's me when I was representing the county as a teenager. It's up there way too long, Santa and I. This is Haley, who's going to school in Florida. She's going to be an environmental attorney. And uh, this was in, well, she was two, so she's 19 now. And this was the first, um, first day that I was ever in the legislature, and that's when I got sworn in with my son, Chris, my husband, Will, and my other son, uh, Sean. So with that... I'm done. Go. Does somebody want to tell me why they think they should care, or did I talk too long? No, I don't think you talked too long. But uh, a question I'd ask you, same questions I asked the, the, the gal from Intelco. I know that uh, according to Claire Fogel's song, and, and the, I'm on the planning unit, part of the planning unit, and. Uh, I know you use a lot of water out of Lake Whatcom and take some of the water from the Nooksack to fill up Augment Lake, Lake Whatcom. Have you ever thought also, as I asked in Taco, of returning some of that water instead of going to the bay back to the river? Yes. <laughs> if Claire was here, he could give you the details. But yes, we've talked about different diversions. We've talked about... Um, what happens when the when the water actually gets to the to Bellingham and what we could do with it, um, and so yes, I think it's very important that we minimize our use of water so that we have that water available for the future. Hi, I'm new to this Whatcom County, and I care because I didn't know I was going to get impacted so much by all these decisions made on water and other uses of rural land. So I just wanted to know for taking action. Is it the, uh, I think it's called the YWAR1? Is that the coalition 
I should be involved in so action will be taken and I know what action to take. Well, the, the organization of the coalition has changed. Certainly the members, the governmental entities that are making up that coalition now should, you, I mean, they, they're your representatives. They should know what you're talking about. But there also is a group of people that advise the county council. And if you want to get directly involved with the group, then I would suggest that that would be the group unless John Hutchings has a different suggestion. So it's a it's really a county led it's a county led activity. All right. The 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 city is willing to be a partner, and I met with some water users probably two two years ago three years ago, and laid out the principles by which I believe the city could participate. So it was looking at water quality in and out of stream uses the things that I mentioned before, and then the city could be a partner because I believe that we, that we can cooperate and do that if we're supporting increased fisheries, if we're making sure that our growth is centering around, around our cities, but you're talking about the rural land, so that's the, really the, the county's responsibility. Well, there's, there's so many people involved, so everybody getting representation and respecting each other. Thank you. That's the key. Uh, I thought your point on uh, how the city has grown. I've only been here for six years. Um, I'm from the East Coast. I've lived all over the United States. Um, my hometown went from 32,000 in the mid-50s to over 280,000, and this was in New Hampshire, uh, which was not distressing because the, the city thrived in its growth, a very unique situation. But the question that I have is, were your parents trying to tell you something when they put you in front of a for sale sign? <laughs> no, they loved me. I was the firstborn. Um, you know, my, my family was very sentimental. We documented many things that other families probably wouldn't have. And that little X that was there wasn't even the piece of property we bought. It was on the other side. I was standing in front of it. But no, I promise you, I was unconditionally loved as a child, which is why I'm so brazen now. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. <laughs>